Hi, I'm Kat. I'm Martin13. Welcome to our show, World Tiger. Building Dragon. Today we are continuing with some of World Anvil's summer camp prompts. Summer camp is a program set up by the World Anvil team to promote world building as well as the community in general. There'll be a total of 33 prompts all throughout the month of July, so if you're looking to win some prizes for your submissions, don't miss out. World Anvil is a free in-browser tool that has everything that a world builder or a GM may ever need. They also have some really incredible subscription options, so to make sure to check those out as well. Totally worth it and affordable. If you're interested, please consider checking them out. But in any case, I think it's time we got to the prompt. Kat, what is our prompt? Today we get to write about a law enforcing organization within our world and how they operate. Interesting choice. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of the one we did a couple days or a couple weeks back. The it was a couple um, days ago. The the uh, organization who operated above the law. Oh, so this one has to be enforcing the law. Within Got the law. Got it. Got it. I'm interested to see where you take this. This will one. be fun. I'm excited. Good. Well, for all of you who are at home who are unsure of what Kat and I are doing, the two of us have a couple parameters in order to complete the summer camp project. Each of us has 30 minutes to answer the prompt. Each of our submissions have to be at minimum 300 words. After our 300 words and our 30 minutes are up, the two of us will come back together and share what we came up with. Some of our best ideas have come from collaborations. That they have. You ready for this? Yes. Let's do this. Time skip! Back. We're back. How are you feeling? Um, I had a lot of fun with this one. I took inspiration from one of my favorite books that I've ever read to kind of create this organization. So, um, want to give them a shout out? Uh, it is called the Godspeaker series by Karen Miller. It is, um, it's a really good series. The first book is called Empress, and that's kind of the major inspiration I took from this. Um, please go check it out. It's a little intense, but um, really, really, really good. On a scale of the Inheritance series to A Song of Ice and Fire, in terms of a ten intensity, where does it fall? It starts at a good nine. It starts hard. Okay. It's good. Uh, okay then. It starts you hard, but it's good. Well, good why stuff. don't you why don't you start us off? Okay. Um, so I wrote about this organization called the Knife Dancers of Avium. Now, if anybody happens to know the book series I'm talking about, it's gonna basically just be a, a recoloring of that. So, um... Homages. Homages, yes. Homages, ladies yes, and gentlemen. Yes, there are some, there are some changes, but it is, yeah. Um, the motto that I came up with for the Knife Dancers are, Our bells sing, our knives dance. So, this idea is that the uh, knife dancers of Avium serve the um, the red the red king of Avium. They are his main guards, his military, everything. Um, during times of peace, they are the peacekeepers within the city limits. Um, on their patrols, their presence is mostly used just to kind of discourage thieves and things like that. Because anybody that hears they backtracking a little bit, they sew bells into their hair. Um, and they don't, another thing where if they are disgraced, they cut off their hair and they cut off the bells with them. But these people don't cut their hair no matter what. So, um, when they hear the bells ringing, it is almost like, better get out of here because the knife dancers are coming and you don't want to mess with them. <laughs> um, so during times of peace, they are within the city limits. Um, and during times of war, they are doing the war thing. Doing so, the war thing. <laughs> I was able to go into um, a bit of the structure as far as how they are commanded. So um, each shell has 10 members, and there are 30 shells all being commanded by the Red King. Um, each troop is given a number to kind of define their status within the Knife Dancers, with one being the greatest leaders. These are the one, this is the shell that is protecting um, the king and protecting the palace and 30 being like the lowest of the low these guys are newbies They don't really know what they're doing even the 30 even shell 30 is highly trained Like best of the best um, So they're just green because they're just green to the knife dancers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. They are still they're not green. No, 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 no. They are still very intense very scary, but um <laughs> 
I was able to also go into every four months, so five times a year, um, they are reevaluated. So the shell ranks kind of get shuffled around. Um, these are going to be tests of strength, dexter dexterity, teamwork, um, as well as they get evaluated uh, as far as their role within the city. So um, the lower groups, the lower shells, get kind of sent to the rougher parts of town to peacekeep and because they're they know what they're doing they're just not the best of the best so um depending on how well they do in their certain sectors within the city um, that will go towards increasing their rank um, every shell is going to report to a shell leader or a shell officer and then that officer reports to the war leader and then the war leader speaks with the voice of the king so they're pretty close to the king in like thinking about it they're only like two steps away from the king just in general as far as rank so they're pretty high up there um as far as culture they're extremely ruthless they're conditioned to embrace death rather than fear it so they face their challenges with cold eyes and controlled bodies they're just out they're to do their machines. job yes yes um Let's see, I was able to go into a bit of, um, I kind of got stuck at after a certain point where I kind of had everything that I knew about the book written down. I was trying to branch off and away from um, what, the, what I was reading. Um, I was able to write just a little part, um, like a little story snippet like I do when I get stuck. Um, and so I wrote, The sound of bells echo throughout the market, each chime whispering to those who think themselves above the law to return to their shadows, for the king's knife dancers are searching for them. So it's just like, look out, they're coming. They're, they're coming. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else I wrote. That was... Could you perhaps expand upon how you become a knife dancer? I didn't write about that. Yeah, very intensive training. I think I didn't write about that because I couldn't find that... In the portion forum. of the forum um, and I guess now that I'm thinking about it I'm starting to get more into the rank of a knife dancer versus the actual organization and their beliefs as far as that is concerned but yeah um, to become a knife dancer you have to go through very vigorous training um, you are trained with your blade with bows um, chariot racing and you are sent out into the wilderness to survive for a year with your shell. You are just told to go out into the desert, survive, whoever comes back gets to be a part of our ranks. And so it's a very select group of people that make it back after being out in the deserts of Avium. Um, and you know what's out there. <laughs> Play the sound bite! No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but yes, no, 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 they... Um, they're hiding elsewhere. Um, but yeah, so, um, now looking back on it, I really didn't, wasn't able to expand too much. I think I kind of was got, I got stuck in the, like, look, flipping back through one of my favorite books and be like, oh, I remember about this part. No, no, wait, I'm supposed to be reading about the knife dancers. And I kind of got stuck in some of those spots, but, um. So they are... I really, I'm really excited about the fact that you got to write about Avium and specifically about something relating to the Red King of Avium. Mm -hmm. Because I know in the past you've gotten really excited to talk about them, or you, you didn't want to talk about them in a particular prompt or mm -hmm. something like that. I just am A, very appreciative of the fact that you were able to do that. Mm -hmm. B, they're a military pro police, yes? Yes. That's cool. That's really interesting. And really, um, they remind me of the Janissaries of the Ottoman Empire. Are you familiar? Uh, that sound, that's ringing a bell, that's like I, uh, way I over there. I hope not to misquote anything, but if I remember correctly, the Janissaries of the Ottoman Empire were um, basically a military police, mm -hmm. but they were like the elite of the elite. Yeah. Um, Often very oh god the the Janissaries look dope and like any depiction that you get whether it's historical or somebody just did an artist rendering or mm -hmm. even what they did for the Janissaries in the Assassin's Creed franchise Ooh. I love the look of the Janissaries um, but I also really like the idea of the bells now you mentioned because um, they're not the Tagura not the Tagura the Utagura the Utagura mm -hmm. 
where the Uthagura don't shave their heads unless they're defeated, these people weave bells into their hair. Right, so... But they still cut them? No, so it's more of a, if you really want to shame one of them, you'll cut off their bell. So each bell is colored and has a certain significance and a certain ring to it. Mm. So um, this isn't something I was able to go into here per se, but... Um, the higher elite and the higher ranking shells will have different colored bells than, like, say, the shells that are 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So, um, they'll have a certain ring to them, so you'll almost be able to tell, listening in, be like... Which shell is which coming. Which shell is, is coming. Around. Right, right. Um, and so they are kind of sewn into their hair, um, and so when they are when they are battling, when they're in the middle of battle, or they're just walking, you'll hear the the chiming of the bells. So, um, the going up against the knife dancers of Avium, going into battle against them, it's almost like you hear music being played. Um, and they definitely use that to their advantage, and they get into, like, a rhythm using their own bells and listening to that, being able to fight as a unit just by listening in and knowing um, the different sound of the bells. Nice. That's really cool. But yeah. So they do, I'm sorry, so the question I had necessarily about their hair was that it, it, it to shame one of them, you would cut their, you would cut right. off one of their bells. Right, right, right. If you so really I can definitely to... see a character, a ne'er-do-well, doing like aiming for the bell yep you're gonna you might kill me but i'm gonna take your bell right off. right but do they you hold one up and it's like mm -hmm. eh. okay so do they but do they cut their hair is that a mm. was that specific or no they just they, like might, cut the, they might cut their hair but they keep the hair strands with the bells right so hadn't thought about that, but that might be something I'd focus on, because now I have two groups of people in Theatrum. I mean, they're on different parts of the world, but... Mm -hmm. mm. I don't mean to give you some, like... I don't know now. ...tough decision to make here. <laughs> now I'm thinking of a knife dancer going up against an Utagura. That sounds like a fun fight. That sounds like an awesome fight. I'd pay money to see that yes. fight. Yes. Yes. And two... Okay. All right, I'm going to stop before I get too excited, because, like, <laughs> ah, okay, either way. Um, but, yeah, that's about all I came up with as far as the knife dancers, so what about you? Okay. Um, that's really cool. I like that. <laughs> so I realized that um, while writing this, I had the Elacrid setting book that I've been, the document that I've been going back and forth to, open to figure out what organization I'm going to write about or if I'm going to write about something completely new. So I decided that I was going to write about something that I already knew was going to be there, but I was going to expand upon it a little bit. And you do this thing every time you world build or you at least create a character or create a culture where you add tiny little details, almost negligible details. Details No that, detail is negligible. No detail is negligible. But they are details that if, for instance, if a story involving these details were to be put to script and be put to film, mm -hmm. those details would be something that the costume department would just write off and not care about. Oh, I hope not. I, they shouldn't. <laughs> they shouldn't. My, my mind is immediately going to the fact that you kept bringing, you have brought up bells and you've used bells a number of different times and just like little auditory things mm -hmm. that you don't necessarily get that come across in literature. I know this is a tangent, I promise it's relevant. Um, but what I think of when you talk about the bells and that, I'm immediately drawn to um, in A Game of Thrones, the book, mm. when Daenerys meets Khal Drogo for the first time, it's at their, not their wedding ceremony, it's at like a, 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 a gala of, right. some, of some kind. But he is described to have bells on him, yes. and he dances yes. through the crowd, like does twirls and spins right. and things. And the mm -hmm. bells were such a huge detail when I first read that because that is so, that image of Khal Drogo with bells and dancing is completely different mm -hmm. than the vibe of the Khal Drogo we got in the series. Mm -hmm. So that is just one of those details that I. From my own experience with filmmaking and writing and scripts so forth, 
that is a detail that would often be pushed to the side, but it's so... It, it's important. It's so important, and it creates such a different vibe about mm -hmm. it, because... I'll get off. I'll, I'll okay. get off. I'll get off this hill. I'll get off the hill. <laughs> the organization that I wrote about is called the Blight Council. Ooh. Now, before we get too into it and think, oh, the Blight, and you've used Blight a number of I times, have. and remind me, I will get back to the little, little detail that I wanted to add in with these guys. Um, the Blight Council is a organization that is worldwide. Um, it is not a domestic law enforcement age, uh, organization. To be frankly honest, it's not exactly a law enforcement agency or organization. I keep saying agency. Um, the Blight Council exists specifically to deal with blights upon Elecrid. Okay. Extraplanar in incursions, um, individuals, uh, brigands who wand are highwaymen. Mm -hmm. So in that way, they serve the law, but to be frankly honest, they are a little bit above the law mm -hmm. in the sense that they have no king or country. Their creed is only to their own, um, but their whole purpose is to the preservation of the sanctity uh, and, and solidarity of the common people. Mm. The people who cannot defend themselves. I would say that that still falls underneath the category as far as a law of... It is their own law, essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the Blight Council, uh, again, their whole deal is exterminating blights upon Elecrid. Uh, I liked how in some of the extra stuff that they had, you could write their motto. And this is very much reminiscent of A Song of Ice and Fire, and I understand that, but get over it. There's a lot of things that are very similar now. You can pick and choose. Um, their motto is, we are the watchers on the roads. Hmm. Capital roads. There's a reason for that. Um... They are a knightly order, they are very well trained, very highly trained, and this is one of those things where, uh, going back to another prompt that we did about the specific soldiers, mm -hmm. this is something that I'm going to have to do for this organization. Right. And I'm really excited about it. Uh, basically, the Blight Council, uh, getting into the meat and potatoes, uh, the Blight Council was founded in the late Second Age, um, after the Second Shattering, um, when there was... when. Basically, this group of individuals came together to fight against the incursions, came to fight against that which did not belong on Elecrid. Uh, they are not a holy order, but the common folk see their uh, actions as righteous and just, mm -hmm. but they themselves are not going around deeming people unworthy right. or what have you or un un unnatural, but that is what they are fighting against. Uh, the public ag their public agenda is to defend the common folk, very simple, very straightforward. I have a lot more text written here, but it basically breaks down into um, public perception as mm -hmm. well, which is something that we've talked about in these prompts as well. Um, for the most part, people appreciate the, the Blight Council and appreciate their agents, um, but in more modern eras where there haven't been like notable incursions, there ha the only thing that's really unnatural that people don't like are the random demon and devil that come onto the scene, or dare I say a werewolf, and there are other guilds to deal with that. Right. They don't necessarily have to deal with that. But where the Blight Council finds its own identity is in the fact that uh, at the top of the order is the Chamber of Wardens. And everyone, if you are a member of the Blight Council, you are referred to as a Warden. Uh, that is your honorific title. It is Warden Cat, mm -hmm. Warden Arden, Warden Mal. Um, but if you are not a part of the ruling body of the Wardens, the Chamber of Wardens, uh, you are either a member of the High Wardens or the Deep Wardens. And there is a difference here. The High Wardens patrol the skies and the and like the surface mm -hmm. they ride around on griffins and hippogriffs and travel between the floating cities of the giants to the dominions of the deva to the surface world itself whereas the deep wardens travel in the underdark 
in the cavern world and the places below. Mm. Scouring and scouting for anything that is unnatural or would disrupt the fabric of solidarity of Elacrid. So that is the difference there. Also, fun detail, because the, the Wardens have made an appearance in-game, they only use their, their specialty. They have melee weapons, but their specialty is in long range. And depending on which you deal with, there are uh, it kind of varies from High Warden to Deep Warden, um, whether or not they use like a crossbow or a longbow. Mm -hmm. But they're the ones who have those like tricked out crossbows with like the flip up shields that they can slam into the ground as like a turret. Um, they're super cool. Like I'm actually really excited about these wardens. <laughs> now that you're talking about it, I think I remember the wardens playing through Elecrate a little bit. I think we ran into them. Did we run into them in the Nocturnal Coast? You might have run into one of them. Okay. The thing is, is that the when you are a member of the High Wardens or the Deep Wardens, you have your group, your squad of people that you right. run around with, and that's usually four or less. And those are just mm -hmm. your people that are you're running around with, so it is not uncommon to find a Warden on the road. That's the point. They are fighting against highwaymen and brigands, and anyone who would like extra planar threats. Right. So they would be you. Would, it, would, it is not uncommon for people to just be traveling down the road and just see a group of wardens hanging out, like guarding the road. Right. Like that's just their job. That's what they want to do. That's what they are there for. Um, See, so I think I've kind of covered really everything. Now you that. said you wanted to add an extra detail. Yes. So this is the detail, and it's because of you that I think about this. They are not going to have bells. Bells have a different... There's a, I'll use bells for a different thing. Yeah. But I really like the idea, since they are dealing with roads, and um, basically uh, being a light on the road, they each carry lanterns of some kind. Like a, a small, identifiable lantern. To mm -hmm. Even if they're not in their normal warden trappings or anything like that, you will see that lantern and know no. that is a warden. Right. So not only could you identify them as a uh, as a warden, someone who has seen these things, someone who has experienced these things, um, but also potentially a guide. Oh. And a hiring a warden to like travel with you down the road mm -hmm. or guide you down the road because they're that's they're the their, road right, warriors. That's, what, like, that's their job. <laughs> that's their job. Right. Um, and to keep you safe on the road. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing, you mentioned road was a capital R. Are you going to go into why that is? Right, so the roads with the capital R was really just me trying to imply all roads. Got it, okay. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is the roads that we see on land, that is the caverns underneath, and that mm -hmm. is the ethereal highways in the sky. They watch every single road. Are there any groups that don't necessarily like the Blight Council, or are kind of like, they're just a bunch of nobodies, they're outdated? Well, really, a lot of people, it's interesting you bring that up, um, I didn't mention this detail, but to a lot of people, at least in the public agenda, or at least in their reception, yeah, definitely in their public agenda, I, I wrote about it, um, they're often mistaken for just adventurers. Like, just a well-armed band of adventurers. Which is okay with them. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, they're traveling not. constantly. They never stay in one place for very long. Mm -hmm. The only wardens who are stationary are the chamber of wardens who oversee everything. Right. But they are constantly moving. So, it really just kind of depends on if the gr if the people, if the town that they are walking into perceives them as these wardens, as the, who they actually are, or just as adventurers, and then it further is, well, what is the town's perception of adventurers? Oh, we don't like your kind okay, around these yeah. parts, or it's just, you know, they're, pa they're passing through, it's no problem. Leave them alone. They might buy some things mm -hmm. and, you know, bring some commerce to the town. So, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I like that. I really like that a lot. They sound like a good group of people. Wholesome squad of people. Without the influence of, like, really any religious, paladin-y, cleric -y vibes to it. It's just, we're gonna take care of things that need to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that you have excelled at and I have not. This is very much an organization that their goal in mind is very 
altruistic, if I may go so far mm -hmm. as to say. They're just, we're here to watch the roads and make sure everyone's safe. <laughs> and <laughs> that's about it. Yep. And fight against anyone who would enter, do otherwise. Right, enter Elecrid when they're not supposed to be here. <laughs> You're not supposed to be here. <laughs> but um, if you've got nothing else, that's all I got. That is all I got. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let us know in the comments below something you enjoyed about today's video, or if you have an idea that you're willing to share. If you enjoyed today's video, please make sure to hit all those buttons that everyone else bugs you about. We'd love for you to join our lunch table. And go check out World Anvil if you're interested. You guys have been great. I'm Kat. I'm Martin13. I'm still waiting on that ramen. We'll see you next time. Bye! Bye.